chapter one, first Peter chapter one, I, uh, I love the uh, writings of Peter because he's so direct. He doesn't give you much latitude. He comes right to the point and says, this is the point I want to make and he makes it and then he moves on to whatever his next point is. He uses as many if not more imperatives in his writing than any other New Testament writer. Imperatives in the uh, original language are commands and he uses a lot of them making the point to us that we should pay attention and do what, uh, what he's telling us, of course, through the Holy Spirit to do. So we're in uh, lesson number three, uh, and we're going to talk about 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 21. Therefore, wonderful word. Uh, one of my old professors used to say, therefore depends on what went before. So therefore, I like therefore, uh, prepare your minds. Uh, King James, New King James says, gird up your loins. Since we don't gird up much in the 21st century, I like the New American Standard better when it says, prepare your minds for action. Notice how he does uh, phraseology. Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace that's brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what he's talking about in the middle part of chapter one is how should saved people, how should people who have become Christians and are living the Christian life, how should they act? And so he uses that word therefore, and it's really, uh, really good because it's a distinctive lifestyle of Christianity he's talking about. And it involves three things. It involves clarity of mind. We need to be clear thinkers as Christians. We need to practice self-control as Christians, and we need to have an active hope. Uh, this is, I think, really good, the idea of clarity of mind, self-control, and active hope means that you're believing and hoping all the time. Uh, prepare your minds for action. Uh, we would say, uh, roll up your sleeves. Uh, in, in our generation, a lot of us, take off your coat and get to work is the idea here. And uh, know that it's in uh, the realm of the mind that he's talking about here. And he says, because you're a Christian, there's a serious new activity that needs to be taking place. And he says, I'm going to share with you what those things are. Conversion to Christ and regeneration by uh, the Holy Spirit are meant to be accompanied by a mental awakening. So he's going to say later on in, in this section that we're studying here that um, we used to act in our ignorance. Now, as Christians, we should have a mental awakening. We should wake up to what being a Christian really means. So um, if we're going to be Christians, then we need to think and act like Christians think and act. We need to dress differently. We need to talk differently. Uh, I know whenever I was, and I apologize, I used so many illustrations from when I taught high school and college, but that's my background, and so I use a lot of that. But it became very apparent to people when I started teaching that I was not going to uh, sit in on their bad, dirty jokes and cuss. And so it got to be kind of a funny thing after a while. If they were telling a bad joke and it was dirty, uh, kind of a joke, when I walked up, they'd stop. <laughs> and then I'd say whatever I was going to say and then I'd leave. And I guess they continued on with that conversation later. I don't know. But uh, if people stood around cussing a lot, I'm not going to stand around and listen to people use that kind of language. It's not going to happen. And so they got to the point after a couple of years, well, Marshall's not going to participate in that, and he's not going to talk like that. And so I wanted to intentionally not be obnoxious, but I wanted to intentionally let people know that I was different in the way that I dealt with things. I didn't cuss at my students. I didn't cuss at other teachers. I didn't even cuss at the principal. I mean, I thought that was pretty good of me to, uh, to do that, you know? Uh, and, you know, I, I lived through uh, four principals 
and um, uh, it was uh, in my time uh, teaching and sometimes they made decisions I liked and sometimes they made decisions I didn't like. We also act differently. And so the Christian's focus is on eternity and not on the now. Um, here and now. I think sometimes we focus too much on the here and now and we need to be focusing more on the eternal. I think to sum up this mental alertness that we're talking about, I wanna give you a phrase that I used to tell my students and I, I would tell them, both at the high school and the college level, I want you to discipline your mind. Boy, the first time I'd say that in class, they'd look at me like, what did you say? And I said, discipline your mind. And every several classes, I would remind them, when you come to my class, I want you to discipline your mind. I want you to focus on the work that we're doing, get that work done. And, and I would say to all of us, me as you as well, we need to discipline our minds because everything starts Everything that we do, everything that we say begins with our mind and so we need to make sure that our mind is disciplined. We also need to be sober. Literally, the word sober means not to get drunk with any alcoholic beverages or by extension with Galatians chapter five, you could say drugs and uh, intoxicants where, uh, and that means legal stuff as well. We don't need to get addicted to that kind of thing. When I had hip surgery, I didn't like the, the really, um, really powerful narcotics that they gave me. And so I had uh, Lisa the first week just keep the ice bag set up, put it on that hip, two Tylenol, two ibuprofen, and keep moving. And I worked out just fine because I don't want to get involved in those kinds of things. I know sometimes the pain is so exorbitant, you have to do that for a while anyway, but I didn't want to get into that. By the way, in Galatians chapter five, um, the word that we usually translate witchcraft is actually the word pharmacia, from which we get pharmacy in the English. And it, it talks about, and the reason why they translate witchcraft there is because pharmacia has to do with putting potions together or the way a uh, druggist used to do. They don't do it much anymore, but you would go into an old time drugstore and they'd actually make the drug right in front of you with a, uh, a pistol and mortar. And they would actually make that and then uh, put it in the particular package you needed and give it to you. And that's the idea behind that. But metaphorically, the idea of keeping sober describes mental alertness. Uh, it's an example of our speech and our conduct. We need to be disciplining our mind. Verse 13 uh, describes a life of discipline, self-control. In contrast, notice the contrast here, to the reckless irresponsibility of self-indulgence, which Peter says, that's what you practiced before you became a Christian. You were self-indulgent, you were selfish, you were irresponsible. Now what do you do now? Now you have a self-control. You've disciplined your mind. You think about what you're gonna do and what you're gonna say before you do it and say it. Now, I know that's not easy. Because sometimes we get a little impetuous like Peter was and we say things that we don't mean. And so, you know, the problem is you can't take it back. So you need to be careful about what you say because you can't unring that bell. Once it's been said, it's out there. And let me tell you, if you've, uh, and I know several of you have been school teachers, you got to be careful what you say in front of students because they're going to repeat it. There's nothing that goes faster around a school than gossip, let me tell you. Or, you know, did you hear what Brother Swindoll or Mr. Swindoll said there? Oh my, in our class in government? Oh, you know, so uh, you need to be really careful about what you say. And when you're teaching classes, you need to be careful as well. But a spirit-filled Christian is not carried away uh, into abnormal, abnormal extravagance of behavior. Uh, we should be able to keep control of ourselves. And so I ask this question here, how do drunks and drug addicts act? And the answer is, they're not in control of their mind. That's why Peter says, keep sober. And metaphorically, he means 
keep your mind alert. And if you want to write that down for a compare and contrast, Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21 is the laundry list of sins that we should not be participating in. And then Galatians 5, 22 through 23 talks about peace and love and goodness and kindness and things which are not against uh, the law at all. So if you want to compare and contrast this idea, Galatians chapter 5 is a good place to go to. Um, Fix your hope. I I like that. I like the idea of hope. I've always liked the idea of hope a lot. Um, One of my favorite sayings comes from Stephen King, the writer, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and good things never die. And we must not let our hope die. Hope is a really good thing. So believers in Christ can be certain of God's favor when Jesus appears, when he comes, when he's revealed, we can be certain of God's favor if we have fixed our hope on him, if we've been mentally alert. Peter is saying that we can only cope with uh, and survive our earthly trials if we spend time meditating on future hope. Um, And I use the word meditating Sometimes people immediately make their mind go off into the Eastern Oriental kind of chanting and that kind of thing. Uh, The way the scripture uses the idea of meditating is deep thinking about things. And I like that idea of deep thinking. I like to do that. I like to read over a passage that Jesus teaches or Peter or Paul and really think deeply about what's the real point that they're trying to make here. So meditating on the future hope, thinking deeply about the fact that when Jesus comes back, I'm going to be with him, okay? Um, He said completely on the grace that is to be brought to you when Jesus is revealed. The only way we're ever gonna be able to stand before Jesus on that day he's revealed is because of his grace. You know, Ephesians two verse eight is very clear. We're saved by grace through faith. All of us are not worthy of God's unmerited favor, but he gives it to us anyway whenever we're obedient to him. So uh, grace, I like that phrase, unmerited favor. There isn't anything we can do to earn it. God's grace is there and it's because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And of course, the fact that Jesus uh, continued to intercede for us. So we're waiting for the day that Jesus is revealed. What is it that defines our time of waiting? So we become a Christian. We don't know when we're gonna die. There's a lapse of time in there, right? You can put it on a scale. There's a lapse of time there. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, I don't know, whatever it is. With that. How do we define our time of waiting? How do we wait for Christ to return? And Peter gives us the answer. As obedient children, do not conform yourselves to the former lust. So now he's making a contrast here. Watch it carefully. This is what you used to be and do, but this is what you need to be and do now. And I love when writers uh, use contrast because uh, contrast is so helpful in our understanding of the way things are, uh, of the way things are put together. So um, the law of Moses, whenever God called the Israelites to be his people, the law of Moses taught the Jews how they should act in waiting for a Messiah. Now in the New Testament, Peter and other writers teach us how we should act as we're waiting for a Messiah to return. He came once to save us, he's coming back to be the judge. Notice what he says, as in your ignorance. Now, we we have to be careful about these kinds of words. And boy, I learned that as a school teacher, you can't use the word ignorant in class. because people take offense to that, and sometimes their parents take offense post. <clears throat> Some of you will get that when you're driving home today. <clears throat> um, 
The idea of ignorance here is not lacking knowledge. That's not what he's talking about here, and I'll elaborate more on that later. But what he's talking about is you were not knowledgeable about God. You didn't, in your former lust, you didn't understand about the creator of the universe and who God was. You didn't understand that. Now, as you have become a Christian, now you can understand that. So in other words, get out of your pagan and heathenistic ways, and now he has called you to be holy, so you should be holy in all of your conduct. Remember, we talked about mental alertness means disciplining your mind, and when you discipline how you think, you're going to discipline how you act. And I used, to, um, I used to tell my students all the time, be careful what you think because that's going to come out in how you act. And boy, we see that in drivers all the time, don't we, around here? You know, I expected whenever I moved from Charleston, as congested as it is, and so many people, that my car insurance would go down. When I moved to the Spartanburg area, my, my car insurance stayed the same. Now this year it went up and we don't have any tickets or accidents. And after driving around here for a year, our, we bought our house exactly a year, two days ago, uh, driving around here for a year and riding around with Carl and Bob and others who have been kind enough to take me around visiting to a lot of families, I understand why the insurance is the same. People are not thinking first before they put their foot on that accelerator or make that turn or don't stop or whatever it happens to be. And so uh, Lisa and I are right in the same situation again. It's not as congested here, but it's the same kind of driving behavior here. So uh, we need to make sure that our conduct is good, and that means thinking through situations first. Notice he's, he's calling us children. Uh, John calls Christians children. Peter calls us children. Um, as obedient children, so I think that presupposes, doesn't it? If you have obedient children, then you also have disobedient children, right? If you compare and contrast those things. So we don't want to be disobedient children. We want to be obedient children. And that means don't be conformed to your former lust. Christians are not to allow themselves to be shaped by the sensuality of their pre-Christian existence. I like that phrase, pre Christian existence. We had an existence before we became Christians. Now we're Christians. We need to be careful. We might be tempted to go along with the norms of society so that they will not stand out as different and escape persecution. But if we're going to be Christians, that means that we are going to stand out in some way. And for some people, that means we're going to be a sand spur in their saddle. They're not going to like us very much because we are different. Um, but being different is part of what uh, the Christian experience, our existence, is all about. <clears throat> um, being a Christian involves no longer doing what we've always done and also becoming something which we have not been. That's a really nice sentence, isn't it, don't you think? Uh, I got that from a, a fellow who teaches in uh, uh, Joplin, Missouri at the uh, Ozark uh, Christian College. Stibbs is his name. I like that statement a lot because that describes what we need to be. People want to judge us. They want to judge us as Christians, don't they? Don't you find people want to do that? They want to judge you? Well, maybe you're not living up to the standards you should. And they want to judge you by our past. But it's what you do and say and how you act now that's important. And so this is one of Marshall's Proverbs. I have about 10. And uh, you don't have to quote them or even give me, uh, uh, give me the uh, uh, credit for it. But I love this statement a lot. I actually got it from a uh, psychiatrist friend of mine in Charleston. We had a psychiatrist in our congregation, and he was a wonderful man. And you could sit down and talk to him about any problems you had. And uh, because he was a member of the church, he never charged you anything. And it was really nice to sometimes clarify your thoughts. Really smart man. I knew him for about four years. But his statement is, your past may explain you, but your past does not lock you in. That means you may have been a drunk in your past, but that doesn't lock you in. You can stop drinking. 
It may have been that you, uh, you know, uh, lied a lot in your past, but that doesn't lock you in. You can stop lying. So you see where this is going. Your past may explain your behavior, but your past does not lock you in. You can change. We can be different is what that means. And I really like that statement a lot. <clears throat> um, now we're coming back to the concept of ignorance again, uh, which were yours in your ignorance. In other words, the way you used to act, the lust, things, that's because you were ignorant of God. And in this case, notice it says, I've written it up there, it's not about intellectual deficiency. Uh, Hagiadza means ignorance on the basis of wickedness of evil doers. Um, it's a willful blindness. Before we're Christians, we just really didn't pay much attention to God at all, kind of willfully. Now that we've become Christians, we need to not be ignorant of God anymore and get involved in paganism or heathenism or the lust that were before, but we should be mentally alert and change. That word is only used four times in scripture. And it, um, sometimes that's really important and sometimes it's not, but I think in this one it is because uh, Peter is the one that uses it twice in Acts chapter 3 and in 1 Peter chapter 1 here. And then later on, Paul uses it, uh, Luke does in 17 and then Ephesians 4. But this idea of ignorance means that um, we didn't know much about God or anything about God. And now we do know something about God. And the result is we should act like a God. And that's exactly what he's going to say. He said, do not conform yourselves to the former lusts which were yours and your ignorance. So this idea has a, a, the meaning of moral and religious defect. That's what we had. We were defective. And now we've become Christians and we're not defective anymore. We know how we're supposed to act. And uh, the Jews, um, Peter is talking to Jews, but I think this letter, this is one of the verses that teaches us that this letter was really written to the Gentiles um, as well as the Jews. Very powerful statement uh, here, indication that Peter writes to the Gentiles. He's writing because he's talking about possibly paganism in the past, although we know Jews were involved in paganism too. Before becoming a Christian, you didn't know the one true God. And morally and religiously, you ignorantly followed the wicked and sinful lust. Now Peter says, don't do that. Before we were Christians, we were unaware of God and lived a life dominated by giving the physical desires of all kinds and acting just like everyone else in the world. But now we are different. We should be mentally alert. We should have disciplined mind and we don't act like everybody else in the world. So verse 15 First Peter chapter one and verse 15. Uh, but he who called you is holy. Okay, how should we act, Peter? This is how you should act. You also be holy in all your conduct. Since we're no longer ignorant of the true and living God, then we need to start acting like him. We have a new standard of living. The true model to be copied is nothing less than God himself. God is now our standard or pattern, not our lust. You see the contrast that Peter's making here, and he does such a good job at it. Holiness provides the ground for this new moral demand. We're now to be imitators of God. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot to be imitators of God. Peter asks us to do something that's not easy and is not natural. <clears throat> I'm trying to find my next segment that I wanted to uh, bring up here. This, this idea of called you is holy, you shall be, or you also be holy in all your conduct. Um, I, I promised you in the beginning that I wouldn't bore you with a lot of Greek, but sometimes the Greek really does clarify. Most of the time you can figure it out in English. But this right here, when he says, you also be holy, that idea of be holy is, um, is passive. In Greek, you have active, passive, and uh, middle voice. And uh, active means you're doing something. Passive means something's being done to you. And middle means that you're doing something to yourself. Okay, does that make sense? You're doing something to yourself. This is passive here. So you're allowing God to 
make you into a holy person. You're passively doing. Yeah, think of it this way. Um, if I'm baptizing somebody this morning, I am actively baptizing. The person that's being baptized is passively being baptized. They're allowing me to do that to them. It's passive, okay? That makes sense? Okay. And uh, middle would be they baptize themselves, which, of course, we don't do. But uh, you get the idea about what I'm trying to bring out here. So uh, be holy, he says, and it's, it's first heiress, it's one of those imperatives, it's a command. He says, allow God, allow God to remake you into a holy person and then live that way, is the idea that he has here. So the true model to be copied is nothing less than God himself. What would God do? What was it, about 20 years ago, we all wore those things around our neck and, and keychains and whatnot, what would Jesus do? And that's really a valid statement. What would Jesus do? What would God do in that particular instance? Sometimes we make the right decision. Sometimes I don't. When he called the Israelites out of Egypt, God did so in order to become their God in a new and special way. He then demanded that those who, his people would be holy like he is holy. Now God is calling us as Christians to be holy just as he is holy. Uh, verse 16 because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now, we know where it's written, Leviticus 11. Um, but Jesus reinforces that concept in Matthew 5, 48, when he says, therefore you should be perfect just as your Father in heaven is imperfect. Uh, the word perfect there means that you are trying to make yourself complete. I really like uh, the New King James and the... Now, New American Standard used the word perfect. I don't like that as well. I like the word complete. Uh, therefore, you shall be complete just as your father's complete. And uh, that means to be the kind of Christian that you need to be. So it's written. We know it in the Old Testament. Romans tells us we should learn from the Old Testament, but we should also listen to the teachings of Jesus as well. Look at verse 17, a uh, powerful verse. And if you call on the Father, when we pray, in other words, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, when judgment comes, folks, gonna be God is completely impartial. We can't be that way. We're not impartial. We have our biases. Uh, one of the problems in studying history is when you read about somebody that's written about a particular event, they're gonna insert their bias into that, and you've gotta sort through that as a historian. What's true and what's their bias? God has no bias. There's no prejudice. There's no partiality with God. Without partiality, God judges according to each one's work. God knows what we do. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Isn't that an interesting phraseology that Peter uses there? Conduct yourself during your stay. We didn't come here to stay here, right? Uh, what is it my mama used to say? Nobody came here to stay. When she got older, I'd say, well, mama, you're getting older. I need to take care of you. Well, nobody came here to stay. She'd say that over and over to me. But he said, during your stay here. So it's like, it's like in this life we're at the Holiday Inn. It's our stay, you know? And then we... Either Jesus comes back and is revealed or we die and go to him, one or the other. But this is our stay. This is the intermediator period. We become a Christian. We haven't died. This is our stay. During our stay, we need to be mentally alert. We need to be holy as God is holy. We need to act like God would act. Um, did I say that all of this was unnatural and not easy? Because it is unnatural and it is not easy to do. If you call on the Father who partially judges according to one's work, God is both our Father and our judge. And we need to strike some kind of middle ground when we're talking about God. Some people are too flippant in the way they talk about God. At least I think that they are. Uh, they're, they're just, they're, they don't treat God with the proper respect that he deserves. And then you have other people that go overboard on all of that. You know, so too often we as Christians seem to be too cozy with God. All right, he's our father, but he's also our judge. Uh, he can be our friend, yes, 
Uh, but we also need to make sure that our conduct and that we're mentally disciplined and we understand that God is God and we are not God. We can't be treating him in too much of an informal manner. On the other hand, we know Christians who are too frightened of God and can't relate to their father at all, and they just see him as a you know, stern disciplinarian God, judge. So somewhere in the middle of that is how we should be treating God from my point of view. We're to walk in the middle path between the two ideas, relate to God as a father, but as a judge. The middle path is not easy, but that's the way we need to be looking at things, my point of view. All right. Verses 18 and 19. Uh, If you have something that you want to say, it doesn't have to be just straight lecture. You can say something if you want. Uh, Raise your hand. Holler at me if I don't see you. My peripheral vision is not as good as it used to be. Be right with you. Oh, oh, I love this. I love all of Peter's writings. James and Peter are such interesting writers. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Wow, that's powerful. Before you were a Christian, you had aimless conduct. Where was it going? Your aim wasn't good. I love the way that Peter phrases these things. And you weren't redeemed. Uh, Redeemed means to buy back. And so we fall into sin uh, as we're growing up, and the blood of Jesus is the thing that buys us back or out of that sin. Uh, We're redeemed. It wasn't gold and silver. Uh, It was his blood. What Peter describes in the next few verses is the church's teaching on the redeeming work of Christ. Okay, Redeemed, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh huh. So you couldn't get out of it. Like, you know, I mean, like, you know, I mean, I just lived always in that, what happened to me. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get past it. And, uh, you know, once you do get past it, what a great place you're in. Oh, it's a wonderful life, isn't it? Yes. Once you. Want- get my sister out of that past. Sometimes you have to, you have to release yourself. You know, God's already released you. Right. You just have to release yourself. Excellent point. And I, told, I told my sister, I said, we're living the same past, we'll say. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, we're living the same past. Uh-huh. And I don't dwell on that anymore, but she brings it up nonstop. Right uh-huh. When she was 10. Yeah. And I'm like, let it go. You feel so much better. But she wants to hold on to that because she wants to bring people down with her. Or I don't know what, what it is, but I feel sad for her. But... If you just let things go, You've heard the phrase, misery heart. loves company. Yes. Uh, some people don't want to forget their past. They want to bring it up so you will, whatever, feel sorry or whatever it happens to be. But uh, your phraseology, I wish I'd have thought to put it in there, Kelly, was excellent. Let it go. Your past may explain you, but it doesn't lock you in. Let it go. And we've got to learn to do that. And it's not easy sometimes if we've had a traumatic past, but it's possible for us to do it because we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We're mentally alert people. We can control ourselves. Um, So redeemed describes ransom money that's used to buy back the life of a slave, silver and gold. We were bought back from sin with the blood of Jesus. Wow. How much more valuable is the blood of Jesus than the silver and gold that buys back slaves? We were, Romans chapter 6, Paul would say, slaves to sin. Jesus, because of his blood, buys us back from that. I love that phraseology that Peter uses here. Uh, With corruptible things, silver and gold, um, silver and gold are going to be melted away when Jesus comes back. Atomized is what Peter is going to teach us later on. He's going to actually use the word atom 
and we're, Jesus is going to burn everything down to the atoms. So silver and gold, nice to have now, but let me tell you what, uh, that didn't buy us back from our sins, not at all. So we need to not get caught up in material things that are gonna be burned up anyway. Slaves are set free by silver and gold. We're set up by the blood of Christ. Okay, set free rather. Verse 19, um, but with the precious blood, oh, I love that word precious, don't you? Things that are precious to us are things that we keep around us. We like certain things. We're nostalgic about certain things. In this case, the blood of Jesus is not just good, not just re has redeeming value, it's precious to us. Uh, notice as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So now Peter goes back and talks about this is what brought us back. And now he's talking about the sacrifice of Jesus, right? A lamb without blemish and without spot. No blemishes. Jesus didn't have any sins at all, period, end of sentence. He was the perfect sacrifice for us. In the Old Testament, animals were sacrificed by the nation of Israel. Now, the blood of Christ, Peter refers to Jesus in sacrificial terms. An innocent victim dying in place of others. And that's exactly what Jesus was for us. Let me tell you something. When I first learned that, I was taught by the Jewel Miller film strips. Anybody ever remember those old Jewel Miller film strips? Jack Cronk and his wife Bonnie taught me with the Jewel Miller film strips. And whenever it hit me in those film strips that Jesus had died in my place, I've never gotten over it. I don't know about you, but I, I've never gotten over that. It still, all these years later, makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck whenever I think of Jesus being the sacrifice for me personally. And of course, for you personally as well. Uh, he lived on this earth and was out sin, so he could be that perfect sacrifice for us. Uh, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Peter uses the last times in lieu of saying Christian dispensation. He's talking about the times since Jesus lived, died, was raised from the dead, the church started until whenever Jesus comes back. That's the terminology here that I believe he's using when he says the last times. Uh, the, uh, that's the idea here. So he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. That phrase is not used very often in scripture. I wrote it down in my, uh, in my notes here uh, about this. Let me get to that page. <clears throat> before the foundation of the world. Oh, I've got it on the screen, I'm sorry. Uh, before the foundation of the world, it's not used. This precise phrase, and it's where it says two places, it should be two other places, because Peter uses it here. And then in John 17, it's the exact same phraseology, before the foundation of the world. And in Ephesians 1, 4, Paul used it, before the foundation of the world. God had this all planned out that his son would come and die for us, we'd be redeemed by his blood before the world was ever created. Um, that's a very powerful statement. Listen, listen to John. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you've given to me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Powerful scripture. Very powerful scripture. God knew the person by whom he would redeem sinful mankind, namely his own son, Jesus. Um, and so I, I like this quote from Stibbs here. So not only the idea of a coming Messiah, but also the idea of a Messiah who would die to redeem his people uh, alike formed part of God's preconceived plan for the world before the creation. God had it all in his mind. That's why I like to say another one of Marshall's Proverbs, God is God and we are not God. What's Jeremiah say? God's ways are not our ways. You can, another way to say that. <clears throat> all right, but he was manifest in these last times. That's the time that we're living in right now. And uh, uh, of course, Galatians 4 and verse 4 talks about the fullness of time when Jesus did come. Uh, he did it for your sake. I like that. Proof of God's love. 
proof of God's love is that he sent Jesus to us. And verse 21, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Wow, that verse says a lot right there. He, believe in God, raised him from the dead. <clears throat> I think I've only got one slide left. We'll finish this one and we'll take prayer request. Who through him are believers in God, another aspect of Christ's work. Christians come to believe in the true and living God by means of Jesus. God raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory. The glory that we'll see one day when he comes back so that your faith and hope are in God. Our faith, that is trust and hope, faith is used in different ways so that we too could share in the resurrection uh, of the life of Jesus. Well, there you have it. Uh, eight verses from 1 Peter chapter 1. Powerful scripture for all of us to uh, live in our lives. And uh, I've already been given one prayer request.